adding a splash of colours to your underpainting can make all the difference. There, it really makes your painting pop. That's quite good fun, I'll try that again. It's getting boring now. Roll the intro. Hello, and welcome back to the studio. Today, it's a Bob Ross classic, Tranquil Wooded Stream, with a little extra twist from me, of course. I wanted to do a little bit of extra work on the watery areas, and I wanted to actually play around with making some little pebbles and rocks poking up out of the water. So, time to have a bit of a play. So, stick around right to the very end, when I'll do this little special effect for you. Well, I'm going to try and do it anyway, as if the technology wants to keep up with me. You'll see what I mean later on in the video. So, sit tight, get those lovely cups of tea ready, and watch me paint for about the next half an hour. Tranquil Wooded Stream, it's a Bob Ross classic. So here's my canvas, 16 by 20 landscape that's laid on its side. I'm gonna start off with gesso, black gesso, and this, a piece of cellulose car sponge that I've doctored up. I take a pair of pliers to it and give it a bit of a nibbling like a mouse. I want to start off by just laying out the position of a few elements of my painting. This is a Bob Ross classic, Tranquil Wooded Stream. On the left hand side, I've got a bit of a riverbank and another bit of riverbank on the opposite side. And this wants to be my horizon line, which is a little lower than halfway down my canvas. I just add a few light marks to start with. And then once I'm happy with the position of things, I'll come back and darken them up a little more. It's going to be a large tree on the right. Same again on the left. It sort of creates a dark sort of frame for my painting. It draws your eye to the centre. Now, I'm going to add one more tree here. And as you see, my banks become a little darker as well. Now, this painting is a little confusing to start with because actually there's a lot of background detail here, which I'm going to be doing with gesso. Adding gesso at this stage means that you can create depth and distance in your painting without trying too hard. It's a neat technique and one that you should try. So let's add some detail here in what will become the stream. Notice how I spin the sponge around in my fingers. and just add dabs and dots of color. Lots of little indescript details way back in the painting. I also go back and try and darken up my trees a little more. It's easy to lose them amongst all of this detail. I'm going to add a new feature to this painting. I want some little rocks and pebbles that are sitting partially submerged. For this, I've got some grey gesso and some black gesso. I'm going to just mix them together with a small synthetic brush. These little stones and pebbles are sort of nicely worn to a sort of flat consistency. So little curved strokes is all I need. Now, they don't show up terribly well and they will dry a little darker. So I'm going to put some more black into this mixture and try painting in the grey areas that I've left behind. You need to flip backwards and forwards sometimes, adding dark rocks over the grey and grey rocks over the dark, of course. Here you see I've gone lighter with that colour. Don't get too sort of accurate with where you position them. Dot them around. Add a few here, add a few there. Change the sizes a little bit. It's very easy to get into a bit of a, well, a symmetry. I'll add a few more to the other side and just drop a few into the water as well. So my underpainting's finished, and this is how Bob did his painting. He got it into black and white. But I want to give my painting a little extra twist. I want to turn on some colour. There we go. Just a little colour here and there might make all the difference to my painting. Sit tight right to the very end and see how this entire scene comes together. Here's my plate. I've got some nice blue and red, green and yellow and a touch of white. I'll mix the blue and the red together just to make a nice little lavender colour with a touch of white. Sort of a nice slate colour. I'm just going to repaint some of these grey gessos with a little bit of this new bluish grey colour. Just a touch here and there. These stones probably will end up being slightly out of the water. I'll also add a few to the other bank, but they may not actually be seen so much in the finished painting. Time to add a few of the submerged rocks. They want to be sort of yellowy green in tone. Touch of white as well. Once again, I go back in over some of the rocks that I've already painted. 
I think these might be in slightly shallow water, so they might be slightly more visible. Just pick a few. They don't all have to change colour. Now, I want to make a nice orangey bright colour. This is for a special effect I have in mind. Light rays passing through water. I'm going to pick out a few stones here, maybe on the edge of the bank, and a few maybe sort of following through the line of the path of light. Hopefully all will become clear as my painting progresses. So here's my finished underpainting. Nice and dry. Make sure it's completely dry before you start adding oils. I'm going to start with this, some Bob Ross liquid clear oil paint. I've got some in a small airtight container, which I'm going to apply using this, an old Bob Ross landscape brush. It's well worn and just about fit for this job just scrubbing in paint. I'm going to use it for some underpainting as well. Now this is important that you apply this very, very thinly. If it's too wet and slick, well, then you'll find it hard to get colour to stick. The idea is to ease the application of glazing colours. As you see, this is the video you want to watch that will explain just how to do it right every time. I'll leave a link to it down below. Finish off my canvas using some long flat strokes to even out the surface. Don't forget, give that one inch brush a nice dry clean. It might be warm, but it's got a few more jobs to do yet. Here's my palette, and I'm going to start off with just a few colours and maybe phthalo blue later on. We'll see. My first colour is one of my favourites, Indian Yellow. I'll start by adding a small amount of this lovely egg yolk yellow colour to the centre of my painting. It goes completely over the top of the gesso and it uses the liquid clear so it makes it easier to blend and spread. You might have to repeat this step two or three times because this colour tends to become weaker as you apply it. Here you see I've started moving out from the centre and it's getting a little bit more sort of lemon in tone. I'll add some more. Also I'll add a little to the water. Look at that lovely golden colour, how it picks up on those greens. Just super. Without cleaning my brush, I go straight into some sap green. Another one of the sort of semi-transparent colours. Mixed with Indian yellow, it makes a wonderful lime colour. I applied my Indian yellow a little further out, because I knew the sap green would sort of dibble away at it a bit. Notice how my painting is starting to really glow. I want to work some out over the top of the black gesso as well. Later on when we put some highlights out there, it'll become important to us. My next colour is Christmas Brown. Equal parts of alizarin crimson and sap green. Hollies and berries. That's how it got its name. Mix these thoroughly to produce a nice warm gingery brown colour. Perfect for the background of my painting. I dry cleaned my old one inch brush and added some of this to it. I'm going to be putting this colour on the extreme edges of my painting. Where you won't see much of it, other than it's just producing a sort of nice warmish tone. I'll add a little to my riverbank and just down into the edge of the water as well. Top tip, stand back from your canvas regularly to see how your painting is progressing. I've changed brushes for the next stage of my painting. I've got a fresh newish brush for this. I'm going straight into a small amount of titanium white. Just a dusting of colour at this stage, right on one corner. This is for the light spot in my background of the painting. I just add a few dabs of colour here and just blend out gently. Titanium white is an opaque colour. In other words, it covers up everything. But if you tap it out well, you notice you can still see some of the gesso showing through. It doesn't mean to say you can't remove it a little bit though. I put a little bit too much on here in the background and by using my brush and tapping at an angle, I can push the colour back to where it came from. Time to mix up a new colour. I've taken my Christmas brown colour and added more sap green to it. I think it's sort of an olive drab tone. I'll also add a small, repeat, small amount of white to this colour. 
This is for the background trees, and I don't want the underpainting to be too bright. I want it to be a little bit sort of more murky. As you see, I'm going to compare it to my background colours. We'll give this a try. I've switched back to my old one inch brush. Pay careful attention to how I load it. I have my brush turned with the logo upwards, and I'm pushing the brush into the paint, creating a little line. Now, Notice how I tip my brush at a slight angle. Not completely over, but just partially over on one corner. Here I'm creating a lovely textured effect and underpainting, which I'm going to add highlights to. You see, I'm looking at individual branches, pushing in from the side of my painting. If you can master these strokes, you'll be able to create lovely foliage in any scene that you paint. Now let's add a few tree trunks. I've added a few drops of odorless thinners to the side of my Christmas brown and I roll my liner brush through this paint. Paint using the tip of the brush. Notice also how I wiggle and jiggle the brush to make a nice gnarly trunk. You won't see very much of this tree through the highlighting so just add the main trunks and branches at this stage. Don't forget, there are two brushes on the go here. A nice newish brush, which I use for that background, and the old brush. I'm using the nice brush for my highlights. Once again, pay careful attention how I push that brush into the highlighting colour, and I favour one corner. I create a line of paint along the edge of the brush. There's the line of paint. See how the brush is nicely opened up. Now, again, tipped at a slight angle, not too far over. Just touch gently onto the canvas. The bristles are loaded heavily with paint and they deposit a little dot of colour here and there. With every stroke I paint hundreds and hundreds of little leaves. As Bob would say, don't get in a hurry and leave a few darks here and there. It's very tempting to fill this tree completely and smother it with highlights. But those little dark areas are important. They give your trees depth and distance. I'll add a few little highlights to the riverbank as well. Maybe there are some little bushes there. I change my colours occasionally. More ochre sometimes, more cadmium yellow sometimes. I'll be loading the opposite corner of this brush for the right hand side. Same technique though, tip it slightly to the right this time. I'll leave a little bit more of that background unpainted at this stage. I want this to look like you're looking down a nice avenue of trees into the distance. I want to add some of that lovely glow of light to my painting just here as well. Now this wouldn't be a Paul Ranson original list. I use my fingers occasionally. I find it wonderful just to be able to put the paint on with the end of the brush and then blend it in with the tips of my fingers. I can sort of sculpt the paint more easily. I'll do a little bit of soft blending with that brush as well. Time to add a little more colour to my mixture. I'm going to put in the rest of my Christmas brown colour with some dark sienna, Van Dyke brown and of course some black. I want a rich dark colour here for the trees that are much more in the foreground. I might even add a little thalo blue. This gives my green underpainting a lovely glossy glow. Perfect for a woodland scene. Once again, I'm going to use my old one inch brush. I dry cleaned it after the last layer of paint. Again, you notice I push into the paint, favoring one corner. And as before, I favor that corner. I tip it slightly and add this lovely dark underpainting. But take care. This is my brush tipped 90 degrees, that's flat. So you can see the camera angle can really be deceptive here. It looks like I'm tipping the brush much further over than I actually am. If you enjoy my tutorials and want me to answer any questions, don't forget to leave a comment down below. Whilst you're down there, you can also click the subscribe button. It really helps my little channel to grow. If you want to do a little more, you can even leave a donation in my coffee cup. 
link in the description. Thank you. This is a repeat of the first layers of paint just with darker colours. Adding layers of colour like this really enhances the depth and distance you can achieve in a painting. Painting wet on wet means that you can use the last colour, sticky and dark, to have a nice base for the highlights to stick. This is the principle used in wet on wet oil painting. I'll use a little time lapse to add a few tree trunks, sticks and twigs to my painting. Now let's have a good look at this nice highlighting brush. After I've done a few layers of paint, no matter how careful I am, it will start to clog with paint. Time for a bit of a brush clean. Give it a good squeeze out and a nice fluffing up on a piece of paper towel. If you keep this brush in nice condition, it'll reward you with some lovely highlights. There, ready to go again for this side and this side of my painting. I tidied up my palette and put out some fresh colour. I want to put some nice bright bushes here. Maybe they're catching a little bit of light coming through from the background. It's a quite sharp colour, but I think it works quite well. As I come down to the waterline, I want this to become duller and darker, a little more in the shadows. Stand back often from your painting to judge how things are going. If everything becomes over highlighted, it loses some of that magic. You see, I'm just adding little touches of colour, standing back, adding a little more and then standing back again. I'm using time lapse here because this section of my painting actually took me about well, half an hour to paint. As I stood back, I also noticed that I was leaving sort of almost black rings around everything. I might not have seen that if I was standing too close. So you notice how I let some of the colour push in from the outside edge a little more. Now here's something that happens occasionally when a brush starts to sort of split apart. It produces sort of little broken ends to my paintbrush. This just needs to be regroomed slightly, maybe reloaded with paint. There, I think that's working slightly better now. Occasionally brushes don't want to behave properly and that's when they really have reached the end of their painting. They need to be washed and dried. It's useful to have maybe two or three nice brushes on the go at any one time. As I stood back, I also noticed that I'd sort of created a bit of a hard edge with the highlighting here. The riverbank looked a bit too uniform, so I'm just using my dark underpainting colour here just to stab in a little bit more shadow again. There, I think that looks a little nicer. And I think it'll also increase the depth of the bank as well. This is sort of the start of the glazing process. More of that in just a moment. I've picked up a nice clean dry filbert brush and a touch of sap green. I want to tip with the colour, it's a bit too sort of lime green at this stage, so I'm picking up some of my underpainting green colour here. I want to think about how the light would be coming through the trees and sort of illuminating the water slightly. This is glazing. Notice how I can paint directly over the top of the little pebbles and stones and details that we created in the gesso, but not losing them completely. This is a lot of fun to do. You can add a little, stand back, add a little more, and it creates the most wonderful detail in a painting without having to try too hard. If you cover things up too much, it's easy. You can just wipe off some of the paint and your pebbles, rocks, weeds, everything is still just as it was. I'm going to carry on using this filbert brush. I'll give it a nice dry clean on some paper towel first, and then go into some cad yellow, a little tiny touch of sap green, and a little hint of titanium white. Not too much though. Remember, titanium white is opaque. In other words, it's going to try and do its best to cover everything up. But with care, you can actually create a glaze of sorts. It looks much more like 
light playing on the surface of the water. As I say, this takes a little care and I apply this colour carefully over those bright rocks that I painted earlier on to make it look as though they're catching the light of the sun. It's a neat trick and one that you should try in your own paintings. I also add the sort of suggestion of a little bit of light playing on the surface of the water in the background. Remember, if you overdo it, you can always rub it out and try again. As many times as you like. If you've watched any of my painting tutorials, you know that another favourite of mine to use is a little cotton bud. If you want to pick out a rock here and there to make it really sparkle, just wipe off some of the paint. The coloured acrylic grins through. I think I also want to bring some of these little pebbles back to the surface again. They were glazed over to make them disappear. Glazing is a subtle technique, so here is a quick before and after. Everything with my painting was going swimmingly, until this happened. Mm. All it captured of half an hour of exciting, exhilarating painting was this one frame. So let's carry on as though nothing happened. All I did was to mix up some light colour. In this case, I used a little bit of titanium white, a tiny touch of the cadmium yellow and white mixture that I used to highlight the surface of the water. I wanted to make these pebbles look as though they were poking out through the water and they had a little water line around them. That's it. Half an hour of exhilarating, exciting, never to be missed painting. Lost because my camera took a tea break. But I hope you get the idea. Just a bit of fun. But I think it adds a lovely sense of detail to your painting and one that I think, again, you should try in your own work. To complete the illusion, I want to add a wet look to my pebbles. Just a tiny touch of highlight to the crest of the stones. A little here and a little there. Anything too bright, you can always smudge in with the end of your finger. Time for some finishing touches. A few little grasses here and there growing out of the edge of the riverbank. Maybe a few little sticks and twigs back here as well, just to hold those little flower heads up. I had a few in here as well, but whew, wow, they're a little bit bright. An easy fix. I pick up my filbert brush and just like that, they're gone. And there we have it. Tranquil wooded stream with a few little twists from yours truly. So there you have it. Tranquil Wooded String, a Bob Ross classic with a little bit extra from yours truly. Try this painting next. You can add colours to the underpainting for this one as well.